I, uh, I spent my entire adult life blaming everybody else for my problems. It was never my fault. Never, ever. You know, if, if my boss would just get off my back, you know, if you would just leave me the heck alone, you know, if, if my ex-husband didn't drink so much, you know, I'd be fine, thank you. It was never my fault. I had terrible luck with cops. You know, and I thought it was brunettes. Everybody knows blondes get a break, right? Us brunettes, we can't catch a break with the police. It's a well-known fact. You know? And I did. I spent my entire adult life making a science out of how to place blame on you and not have to, have to look at me. And honestly, one of the greatest freedoms that I have in Alcoholics Anonymous is the freedom of accountability, the freedom of knowing where the problem lies, and how to fix it. And I get to wake up every morning and look in the mirror and look at that problem. And I know exactly where to come to fix the problem. So I, um, I lived in New York for quite a while. New York is a great place to be an alcoholic because nobody notices. <laughs> nobody notices. And you don't have to drive. You know? I can't tell you how many times I have uh, been woken up by the cab driver to say, Hey, lady. You're home. I say, oh, okay, well, that's good. I got a call one, uh, one day in my office, and uh, it was from a hospital, a VA hospital in Tampa, Florida, and my father was down there, and uh, he was dying from the disease of alcoholism. And I got the call saying, you know, he could go any time. So I just packed a little bag and went down there, and you know, it, it's, it's a very painful death. Alcoholism is a very, very painful way to go. Your, uh, your internal organs start to shut down. You know, your kidneys and your liver, and, and you pee in a bag on the side of the bed, and you pee black. And your stomach is all distended, and it's, it's extremely painful. In fact, I once heard it described, you know, the, the power of denial. You know, if you went into a hospital, if you went out to Sunrise Hospital, and you walked into an AIDS ward, and people are there dying of the disease. And they've got running sores, and they've got machines and tubes all over them. And if you walked in there and you said, I can save your life. If you are willing to read a book, go to a meeting for one hour a day, clean house and work with others, I can save your life. They'd be tearing the tubes out of their arms and crawling across the floor to get to you. You go to that same hospital and go to an alcohol ward, same thing, distended tummy, stomachs and, and tubes in their, in their arms, and, and you say, you know, I can save your life. If you're willing to read a book, go to a meeting for an hour a day, clean house and work with others, I can save your life. You know what you'd hear? Yeah, but you don't understand. I'm not really an alcoholic, you know. If you had my problems, you'd drink too. I mean, all the things that we say. So I got down to Tampa, Florida, and was with my dad. And uh, he died of this disease very painfully. And um, I never did go back to, to New York. Um, it didn't take long to get involved in the drug, sex, and rock and roll. And my, my best friend, alcohol. And I never did go back to New York. And in fact, I shipped my father's body home and let my grandmother bury her only son alone because I was in a party. And I didn't want to miss a minute of that party. And my grandmother probably loved me more than any human being has ever loved another human being. And I let her bury her only son by herself because that's what alcoholism does to me. So I stayed in Florida and uh, had my first DUI, had my first arrest there. Actually, you know, gosh, I do this all the time. Actually, it was my second arrest. I, 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 I always forget the first one. I don't count the first one. You know, it was, it was kind of like a misdemeanor for marijuana coming back from an Almond Brothers concert. And it was like, well, it doesn't count. And I, 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 it's like, yes, it does. Yes, it does. So uh, my second arrest <laughs> was a DUI in Florida and scared me, scared me bad because I was driving in a blackout. I came to handing my driver's license to the police officer. We had already had a conversation, right? 
red lights, pulled over, we're chatting, and now I can get my driver's license out. That's when I come to. It scared me so badly. I swore I would never let that happen again. Three months later, I got popped again. Because at the time, I didn't know what the problem was. My ex-husband was the problem. You were my problem. Everybody was my problem, except alcohol. Alcohol was my solution. And I know today that if I don't know what the problem is, I can never find the solution. And I didn't know what the problem was. So I was able to, uh, to move. I was able to leave Florida and go to another state. And that was back in the days when uh, all the computers weren't hooked up. You could just sign a little piece of paper saying I lost my driver's license. They'd give you a new one. I thought that was nice. So I got new, and I stayed in Pittsburgh for a year and went back to, uh, to Tampa. And that's where I met my, uh, my soon-to-be husband. You know, he may not have been Mr. Wright, but he was sure Mr. Wright now. And that worked. And, uh, and we drank and partied just the same. In fact, he drank and partied just a little more than I did. And that way, uh, I could always look at him as having the problem. And being a good wife, and I know some of you can probably relate to this, I need to set a good example for that alcoholic husband. Plus, he was drinking a little too much of my vodka, so I keep my vodka in the bedroom. And I come home from work, and why should I be denied a drink? Because he had a problem. And I get a, you know, half a glass of something, go in the bedroom, fill up the other half with vodka, and walk out and set a good example for that alcoholic husband. One day, he actually found a bottle hidden in a, an empty bottle, hidden in the shoebox in the bedroom. He said, Karen, what the hell is this? And my philosophy was always, deny it till the day you die. You say anything with enough conviction, they're going to believe you. But see, there were only two of us living in the house. So if it wasn't his bottle, it was a pretty... But I absolutely not only denied it, but was insulted that he would think that that was my bottle. So I knew that he truly was my problem. And I knew that if I could just get rid of that alcoholic husband, I'd be fine. So I dumped his sorry ass in Florida, had a chance to move out to California. It was 1990. I always loved new decades. There was something about a new decade that was, it was like this clean slate, you know, a whole ten years to start over. And so I got out there, and I got a great job, and I bought a big house to show my mom that I was okay. And, and I, it, it, I knew that everything was going to be fine now. But it's that old, you know, but I took me with me. And I still didn't know what the problem was. So I was only out there about nine months before I get popped again. Now, this is my fifth arrest for alcohol and drugs. And this one, we'd actually been playing softball. Because I, I ran into a lot of people that, that partied like I did, but had fun doing it. And we did a lot of fun stuff. There were excuses for three-day drunks, you know, but we'd, we'd do chili cook-offs. We'd be on chili cook-offs. We'd take caravans and go do chili cook-offs all Southern California and Nevada and Arizona. And it was an excuse to stay drunk for three days. This day was softball. We were playing softball. So we started about 10 in the morning and started drinking beer. And by 7 that evening, I'm driving home. And this old broad pulled out in front of me. I couldn't believe it. Now, she shouldn't have even been driving. Pulled out in front of me. And thought, I had to just nick her on the fender. Because... And I was, I had gotten to such a degree of arrogance and denial in my disease that I waited for the police because I wanted them to know it wasn't my fault. She shouldn't have been driving. And I didn't want my insurance rates to go up. Didn't take those police, those dumb police, too long to figure out who's, who was the problem. And once again, taken out of my car, hands behind my back, in handcuffs, taken to jail. And I still did not see a problem. I look back now and it's like, how could I not see a pattern here? How could I not see that my life was an absolute disaster, a train wreck? But I didn't. I truly didn't. And this time I was actually sentenced to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I had to go to these stupid meetings. And I was so angry when I got here. I could not, I was so angry. Because I had to sit there and watch all of you having so much fun and saying stupid things. Now you say things like, 
it's the first drink that gets you drunk. And I think, well, then you didn't drink like I did. It's four or five before I can catch a buzz. You're a bunch of light, light in the loafers. Then you'd say things like, um, how grateful you were to be an alcoholic. How happy you were to be an alcoholic. And I'd think, I wonder how happy you'd be if I stuck a pin in your eye. What's the matter with you people? Good Lord. Don't you know that I am a hard partier, not an alcoholic? And how sad that you don't know the difference between a hard partier and an alcoholic. But I had to come to these meetings to get my card signed. And today, you know, I say, I don't care what brings you to Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't care if it's the court system. I don't care if it's the cookies and the coffee. I don't care if it's the babes. Whatever gets you here, as long as you stay long enough for AA to kick in, that's all that matters. So I had to sit in these rooms and get my card signed. And after a while, I couldn't deny who and what I was. And I saw miracles in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous like I had never seen anywhere else in my life. I was on a six-month court card, and I, I still drank for five months. I had no intent. Why would I want to get sober? I mean, I didn't. I was an alcoholic, for heaven's sake. And I know today that I caught the disease in these rooms from all of you. I was not an alcoholic when I got here, I'm pretty sure. But I heard my story over and over and over. And I saw the miracles that only happens in these rooms. You know, and I would see people crawl into the rooms, so broken and so sick. And in a few weeks, you know, their health is back and they've got roses in their cheeks and they've got some friends and then they get a little job and there's a God in their life. And their lives change. And it was it was visible and it was it was it was palpable. You know, you could see it and feel it and the energy and the, the magic in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous were like nothing I had ever seen before. And I knew I, I knew I wanted this thing. I knew I wanted to try it. But it was the scariest thing I could imagine. You know, even though I had hated the woman that I had become, it was familiar. I knew what a drunken woman looked like, sounded like, and acted like. I had no idea what a sober woman was about. And I couldn't imagine life without alcoholic drugs. I mean, how do you take the edge off? How do you have fun? How do you do anything without anything? And I'm always amazed at people that can get sober like before the holidays. Because even though I had decided this is what I wanted, I couldn't get sober until after Super Bowl. One more kick-ass party, then I'll try this thing. Because I still wasn't convinced what the problem really was. So I went to this Super Bowl party, and I promised myself I wouldn't get drunk. I promised myself. But what I didn't know was that once I put any amount of alcohol into my body, I lost the power of choice. I had no idea how much I was going to drink, what I was going to do, or who I was going to end up with. And sure enough, as soon as I started drinking, I last one to get home, in fact, never made it home, ended up on somebody's couch, went to work on Monday, sick as a dog. That Tuesday, it's down in Orange County, Southern California, I had to go up to L.A. for a Kings hockey game for work. <coughs> so, ooh, hello. Um, so I get to the hockey game, and I couldn't drink the way I like to drink. So I had literally two big cups of beer, and they were big cups of beer. Nothing happened. I couldn't even cop a buzz on two big cups of beer. And something in my head said, then why bother? But, Whoa, where did that come from? Because my head would have said, then have two more. So I know that that was my, and it wasn't my first. I had had experiences like that throughout my life, but chose to ignore them. But I had spent enough time with you all in those five months on the court card, even though I was still drinking, to know that this was a voice not to be ignored. And it was at that exact moment, because in Southern California we always read two things. We'd read chapter 5. And then we'd read that, that portion of chapter 3, more about alcoholism. 
And I knew for the first time exactly what you were talking about when you said, the great obsession of every abnormal drinker is to control and enjoy his drinking. And on Super Bowl Sunday, when I enjoyed it, I could not control it. And on Tuesday at the hockey game, when I controlled it, I could not enjoy it. So why bother? I knew I was done. Went to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous the very next night. And it was a club. Uh, those cold metal chairs and, you know, all that stuff hanging on the walls and the, the shades and the mottos. Because I used to read the walls. When I was sick of hear, listening to you guys, I'd read the, read the walls. And I must have read that first step a hundred times. And this night I read it and I knew to my toes that I was an alcoholic and that my life was totally unmanageable. And I asked God for help in a way that I never had before. It wasn't, God help me and I'll never, or God help me and I promise I'll. This was just, God help me. And I was willing to do anything for that help. And my experience was, sitting in that cold metal chair, literally a wave of energy came over me. And I knew that God was in that room. And I went home that night from that meeting, and that half-gallon jug of vodka was up in the cupboard, like it always was. And for the first time ever, I did not have to open that cupboard. And all the times that I had sworn I wasn't going to drink that night and would end up opening that cupboard anyway and standing in front of the refrigerator with a glass full of ice going, tomorrow, all right, I'll do it tomorrow. And tomorrow never came until that night when I left that AA meeting. And I have not had to open a cupboard of any kind or take a drug of it. Well, that's not true. I'll correct that of any kind since that day forward. Now, I did I did smoke some pot after that. I didn't know it counted. I swear to God, I didn't know it counted. <laughs> and after about, I don't know, five or six days, I, I even stopped doing that. because And not because I thought I had to. Just because I thought, well, I don't want to do this anymore. But I was probably about 60 days sober, and somebody came into a meeting of AA and, and was sharing how they had lost six years of sobriety. And they'd come to Las Vegas, as a matter of fact, and smoked a joint. And I went, oh, damn. I mean, that counts. And I had to change my sobriety date. And um, a friend of mine told me at the time that, you know, we've got the rest of our lives to take chips. We only had today, to be honest. And that stayed with me all this time. And, and I believe that in my heart of hearts. That today I must be honest if I get to keep this gift. So again, didn't have to open that cupboard, and I knew that that was the second step working in my life, that God was restoring me to sanity because I couldn't not open that cupboard. I had tried time and time again, and I couldn't not do it. So turning my will and my life over to a God that could not, that could not open the cupboard when I couldn't was really a pretty easy thing. You know, I mean, the, the power of that higher power. And, you know, anybody who's tried to do it on willpower knows it's got to be about higher power. Because that willpower doesn't work. In fact, my dad, who was a, obviously an alcoholic, he used to joke about, you know, well, I don't need any willpower. What I need is some won't power. You know? And we do. You know, we make jokes to stay in our disease. You know, we, we laugh about how pitiful and incomprehensibly demoralized we become. And I know that was a way that I stayed in my, in my disease a lot longer, too. And I used to joke about, you know, people live their whole lives without ever seeing the inside of a jail, and here a woman of my stature have been arrested three times. <laughs> of course, two more to come, you know. And uh, it, it, it's sad when I look back now, you know, the, the way that I could make excuses for my behavior. So the third step became very easy for me. But what became tougher was realizing the difference between believing in a God and trusting in God. Huge, huge difference. And it's like the story about the guy that's uh, you know, walking along the edge of a mountain 
and he falls into this bottomless chasm. And he's falling, and he's falling, and he's falling, and finally there's a branch. He grabs onto this branch, and his heart's pounding, and he looks up into the heavens. He said, if there's a God up there, please show yourself. This booming voice comes out and says, I am your God. Let go of the branch. Guy looks up and says, is there anybody else up there? <laughs> yeah. And that's what that third step's really about, is letting go of the branch. You know, that, that's not easy. But once I could really let go of the branch and know that my higher power was going to be there to catch me no matter what, that was freedom. That was true freedom. And again, the God of my understanding today is not the God that I grew up with. And honestly, if anybody out there, if you're having a problem with God, don't worry about it. That's not even the one we're talking about. You know, it's a whole different God. And the God of my understanding today is truly one of perfect and unconditional love. Perfect and unconditional love. And by definition, that means God doesn't love me anymore because I'm sober, then he loves the drunk still in the gutter. It's perfect and unconditional. I don't have to earn it. If I'm bad, God doesn't withhold love. There are no degrees to perfect and unconditional love. God doesn't go away when I'm bad. I go away. Perfect and unconditional. Because a lot of times, you know, I hear people say, you know, why did I get it and somebody else didn't? Or, you know, like, God struck me sober. That, that has not been my experience. Because I know I have lots of opportunities. You know, that little voice so many times had given me the chance to come to all of you and I didn't do it I just didn't do it so I still got to be at least willing enough to pick up the kit of spiritual tools and then God will just do everything I need to help me stay here but I've got to have at least a, a teeny jot of willingness to get this far because I don't believe that God loves me any better than anybody else out there because it's perfect and unconditional. So I got real involved in Alcoholics Anonymous because I lost my job. I lost everything. In the first six months of my sobriety, I uh, had my heart broken. In fact, he broke up with me on the day that I lost my career. It's like you couldn't have timed this a little better. Good God. Man. Oh. Lost my, had my heart broken, lost my career, lost my home had a cancer scare, and my house was robbed all in the first six months. And it's the greatest thing that could have ever happened to me because it showed me that there was nothing that a drink would make better. Nothing that a drink would fix. In fact, all it would do was lose, make me lose what little bit of hope I had finally garnered by getting sober and staying with all of you. So it, it was pretty amazing. And it just shows me that I don't know what's good for me. You know, and it, it's like Bill's story. You know, he's in the lobby of the hotel, just lost his big deal, doesn't even know how he's going to pay his hotel bill. He's got to call Lois and say, oh, Lo, I did it again. You know, we have no money. Went, oh. He thought that was the worst day of his life. And ended up being, two days later, starting something that has created a solution and a lifeline for millions of us. So we don't know what's good for us. That's why I've got to be grateful for everything that God gives me and everything God takes away because I have no idea what that big plan is. And I have to trust and let go of the branch and know that it's going to be okay. So I got real involved in Alcoholics Anonymous because I didn't work for a year. Got involved in my fourth step, you know, I just wrote and wrote and wrote because it had to be perfect and I went to seminars and workshops and, oh, God, it was ridiculous. Just do it. Don't, don't go crazy on doing it perfectly. Just do it because we're going to have to do another one anyway. I mean, there's no way I could remember all that stuff that early. So I found a sponsor and I did my fifth step with her and, I mean, really, I, I wrote so much. You know, we share in a general way and I, not me. I... 
people from back in third grade that I didn't even know were on my resentment list. It's like, oh, God. And at one point, my father, you know, we met outside about 3 o'clock in the afternoon in a park, and now it's starting to get dark, you know. She reaches over, she's flipping through the pages, and I'm like, God, how much is left? At one point, she, she rolled her eyes and says, oh, God, so many men. And I go, Peggy, I don't think you're supposed to say that. And then she told me some of her stories. But, you know, it's like, it wasn't this great experience. And then we literally, because by now it was dark, went back to the car and we leaned down by, crouched down by a fire hydrant underneath a street lamp and did six and seven. And that was it. So a lot of people talk about their fifth step, you know, being this great archway where they walk to freedom and they're so, it's wonderful. That was not my experience. You know, this was not, not the, 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 great, the, the great thing that you all had told me about. But that just proved to me that it's not about the person, it's not about the event, it's about the power of the step. Because I didn't have to drink over any of that. As far as six and seven, you know, I, and I always lump them together because I can't separate them. I think they are the two most overlooked and underrated steps that we have. You know, we tend to, because honestly, because the book doesn't spend that much time on them. You know, you go home, you take your book down, you go to a quiet place you, for an hour. It, it's not, it's not as, there's so much power in six and seven. In fact, to me, six and seven are like three on steroids, right? I mean, in three, I turn my will and my life over. On six and seven, I am saying, God, here I am, warts and all, good and bad, take me. These are the steps where I get to decide just how willing am I to be happy. These are the acceptance steps for me. How willing am I to be happy? So if I can accept who I am and who you are, I can stay in a pretty happy space. But what that means is I've got to to be in God's will. And I always use this sailing analogy. You know, if, if I'm sailing and the wind is to my back and in my sail, I just, like, across the lake. Now, even if the wind is not completely in my back, but I'm still willing, it's like tacking, right? When you go a little bit this way and a little bit that way, a little bit that way, it takes me a little longer to get there, but I'll still still get there to my destination. And then there's those days when the the wind is in my face, And even though I know it doesn't work, even though I know God's will means the wind is in my back, I will stand there with this little handheld fan going, come on, come on, we can do this, come on. It doesn't work. It never works. And I have to keep coming here because I forget. I so easily forget how easy it is for me to be happy. And that just means... Let go of the branch, be in God's will, and accept me and accept you. Not easy. It's not easy. The eighth step. I love a great story about the eighth step. Down in Orange County, I used to go Sunday mornings to this meeting at Hogue Hospital. Big hospital meeting. There was this guy. Comes, he's still got his hospital gown, you know, his hospital plastic on his wrist, and He's doing the Thorazine shuffle, you know, coming down the, the aisle there to sit down. And they ask him to read the steps. And he's mumbling through, you know, and it gets to H, you know, made a list of all people. And he goes, Jesus Christ, did you guys see this one? <laughs> Swear to God, that's a true story. True story. And, and you think about it. I mean, became willing to make amends to them all. That is so huge. I mean, that is really a big deal. The courage that it takes to to become willing to make amends to them all. I mean, it's a stunning, stunning event to think that we can finally clean up all that wreckage and that we're going to be willing to do that. And the ninth step, you know, that truly was, was my arch through which I walked to really find freedom. You know, and, and the ninth step is, is, you know, I mean, I've had some bad experiences with ninth steps, to tell you the truth. Uh, one was with my mother. Um, I went over to Phoenix and um, took my mom out. We had coffee, and 
I told her that, you know, I had my father's disease and that I need to make my amends to her. And I owed her some money and, uh, and I owed her a lot of time. Um, and the first words out of her mouth when I said, you know, Mom, I'm, I'm an alcoholic were, well, I'm not. Good thing this isn't about you. <laughs> okay, then. And then the next thing she said to me was, you don't have to tell Russ, do you? That was her second husband. She was ashamed to have a daughter who was an alcoholic. And that's when I learned it wasn't her job to understand my disease. It's my job to work my steps no matter what. And I never was allowed to tell her husband or anyone else on that side of the family. And that was okay. That was okay. The unfortunate part is she developed Alzheimer's. And, uh, you know, I hear so many of you in here talk about the wonderful loving relationships that you're able to gain now with your families and especially the women with their mothers. And that too has not been my experience. But what I get to do today is pick my mothers and pick my sisters and pick my daughters. And that is the great gift of Alcoholics Anonymous. So, step 10. Step 10, I absolutely love. That's the one that just saves my butt over and over and over. And any time I read that step, it's like I'm amazed how Bill Wilson knew my heart. In fact, I'm amazed every time I read the big, big book, you know, how this wrinkled old white guy knows my heart today. The 10 step says, when I'm wrong, I promptly admit it. doesn't say when I'm wrong and the next time I see you, I'll admit it. Or... The next time I happen to think about it, I'll admit it. Because Bill knew that an alcoholic of my type, which, given enough time, this keen intellectual alcoholic mind could rationalize anything, including murder, given enough time. Bill knew that if I waited 24 hours, well, I wasn't that bad. And in 48 hours, well, hell, it was all your fault anyway. I don't know you meant. Yeah. So that promptly thing is so vital to my sanity and my well-being. And even if I'm 10% wrong and you are 90% wrong, I've got to keep my 10% clean. I've got to keep... And gosh, I hate that part. I just hate that part. Because I hate making amends to assholes. You know? So when i got that 10%, I try and keep that real clean. Real, real clean. And, you know, the 10th step also talks about restraint of pen and tongue. I said, hell, if I had restraint of pen and tongue, I wouldn't need the 10th step. You know, and I'm not there, right? It's progress, not perfection here. But I've got to make sure that my side of the street is absolutely clean. Because I can get into denial. And I, and I call them my little shit chips, right? And for every time I don't make the amends, every time... I deny my behavior every time I think you were worse than I was. All those little chips start to build up. And if I let them build up too high, I won't be able to see out anymore. And if I can't see all of you, then I'm lost. So I must work a rigorous 10th step just to stay centered. In 11, I love 11 so much because this is the step where I get the power back. I gave it away in step one. I admitted I was powerless. But in the 11th step, I sought through prayer and meditation the knowledge of God's will for me and the power to carry it out. I get the power back as long as I'm in God's will. And it doesn't say the understanding of God's will and the power to carry it out. Just the knowledge. So again, I've got to let go of that damn branch again. And just pray for the knowledge and the power to carry it out. That is an incredible step for me. I don't meditate as much as I should. I go through phases. And when I'm in it, it's like, man, why doesn't everybody do this? This works. This is so cool. And then I forget. You know, life happens. I get busy. 
But when I'm in it, oh, it's, it's an incredible thing. People tell me, like, my skin looks better. It's, it's amazing. Meditation is really works good, gal, sometimes right now. And then the 12th step. For me, the 12th step is not optional. It is absolutely mandatory. In order to keep this gift, I must give it away. And for those of you who know me, you know that I stalk newcomers. It's my job. That's what I do. And um, because they give so much more to me than I ever give to them. So much more. And you know, the, the 12 and 12 talks about the 12 step and, and all the things we can do short of, you know, being at the podium, you know, sitting in a meeting in that same seat, sharing in a meeting, making coffee, being a greeter. There's so many things that we can do to be of service in Alcoholics Anonymous. I also believe there are a lot of things that we cannot do that is also a 12 step in AA. In fact, there was a story that I heard, um, and it's probably an urban myth, but I love the story because it, it, it describes so much. There was a, a woman in, in Alcoholics Anonymous who had a, a dear friend at work who was not an, an alcoholic. And this AA gal, you know, was sleeping with someone in Alcoholics Anonymous, a married man in Alcoholics Anonymous, and would go to work and tell her friend about this. And several years later, the other gal's husband develop a disease and she wouldn't let her husband go to AA because she thought that this was a place where we sleep with other people's husbands so even the things I don't do can be a 12 step things like when a newcomer comes to me and is complaining about their sponsor and whining and why she told me this or me, 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 me. for me not to side with that newcomer for me to never say Well, yeah, your sponsor shouldn't have said that. That's a 12 step. Because I'm not the one getting the calls at 2 in the morning. I'm not the one who knows this person who's answer shopping. So for me never to say, ooh, your sponsor shouldn't have done that. You don't have to listen to her. That's a 12 step to me. I think another 12 step is... um, when the guys don't run up to a woman newcomer after a meeting. Regardless of how altruistic and spiritual your motives may be. <laughs> Leave her to the women. Leave her to the women. Because truly, you may have wonderful, wonderful things to share. But the one thing you can never teach a newcomer woman is how to be a sober woman. We can do that. Please give us that chance. So you're not doing that, I think, is a very important 12th step. So there's just lots of, <laughs> lots of things that we do and don't do that make us walking big books. Make us walking big books. And as, uh, as you know, I, I have been very blessed and honored with, uh, with having a, a story in the fourth edition of the big book. And you talk about the ultimate 12th step the gift that keeps on giving, oh my God, it's, it's without a doubt the most humbling thing that's, that's ever happened in my life. And um, so I'm going to tell you one quick story and then, and then I'll, I'll stop. But, and this isn't about me, truly. This is not about me. This is about the power of the book, the power of the program, and the power of God. Uh, there was a gal in San Francisco who asked if, she'd have, if we could have coffee after a meeting. I said, sure. And she told me this story. Um, she's a young attorney. And she knew she was an alcoholic, but she frankly didn't care. You know, when you're still young, you know, and, I, and I'll tell you, when you're young and you're a drunken woman, you can still be kind of cute. In your 30s as a drunken woman, not so cute. In your 40s as a drunken woman, you're just damn pathetic. You know, it don't get any better. But she was still young and cute and getting away with it. And she went to this, uh, this woman's meeting on Friday uh, evening at 5.30. And she just didn't, didn't connect, didn't fit in. You know, they were just too happy. Yeah, and I could relate. You know, pin in your eye. You know. So she left the meeting and didn't feel that, that this was going to be good for her. But somebody had given her a book. And she thought, okay, 
Let me see. Let me try a, a story. Maybe I can relate to a story. And it's one of those you can just open the book to any page. She happened to open the book to a story with, that was called Crossing the River of Denial. She read that story and she told me that for the first time in her life, she could identify and she totally knew that she was an alcoholic. She started going to meetings. She got a sponsor. She worked steps. And about a year later, you know, you kind of get to that plateau and you're thinking like, oh, ah, maybe this isn't for me. And so she was going to this newcomer's meeting down in this neighborhood in San Francisco that I mean, there was never any parking down there. And so, of course, her head is lying to her about all the stuff that our heads lie to us about. And uh, she made a decision that uh, if there was a parking space, she'd go to the meeting. If there wasn't, she'd go to the bar. And honestly, in San Francisco, you do make life-changing decisions based on parking spaces. I mean, <laughs> you have to. I mean, you, you have to. So she gets there. And there's a parking space right in front. Impossible. There it was. So she pulls in and uh, sits down at this meeting. It was a speaker meeting, a speaker discussion meeting. And uh, she's sitting there, this woman sharing, and all of a sudden she goes, Oh, my God. That's the woman from the story. So she was this close to going, and I had not only never been to that meeting, but had never shared at that meeting. And here I was, telling the story from the podium that she had read in the book. And she knew that this was God working in her life, keeping her in Alcoholics Anonymous. So again, it's not about me. It's the power of God and the power of this program. And what it can do for all of us if we just stay together, if we just stay close. You know, and... When I first got sober, and I told you I was a little angry, um, and I used to be in this thing about, um, I used to call the balance in the universe. It was really about getting even, you know. And I shared at a meeting one time, and this old-timer came up to me afterwards. He goes, kid, he always called me kid. I always liked that. Thank you, sir. Kid, so you want to get even, huh? Why don't you start with the people who have been kind to you? Whoa. That was one of those life-changing comments. There was another old-timer in Southern California who used to, uh, every day, get on his knees, put his arms out, look up to heaven and say, surprise me. <laughs> huh? Is that a great third step or what? Just surprise me. And what a surprise it's been. What a surprise this life has been. It just, it, it never stops to amaze me. It's the e-ticket at Disneyland. What a ride it is, and I wouldn't give it up for anything. Thank you all for letting me share.